Hi, Daddy Gang. I'm here with the vice president, and she's being so slay. This has 38,000 views? No, no way. This is a re-upload, right? Her daddy. It is good to be with you. Thank you so much for being here. Of We're in the final stretch of the election. Yes. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great, and I'm feeling nervous. You know, there's this old adage, there are only two ways to run, without an opponent or scared. So there you go. The only thing that matters is really just spending as much time as I can, as much time as I possibly can, meeting with people and talking with them about the stakes and, and their future. I'm curious, like you don't do too many long form interviews. What made you wanna do Call Her Daddy today? Well, I think you and your listeners have really got this thing right, which is one of the best ways to communicate with people is to be real you know, and to talk about the things that people really care about. I mean, what I love about what you do is that- Oh my God. Oh, your voice and- I, This is one of the, this is a barred out one, dude. This is a barred out one. I know that you were primarily raised by your mother. Yes. Can you share with me, like, what values did your mom instill in you from a young age? Well, you know, similar to what you described about your mother, my mother definitely, impressed upon us the importance of us being able to express how we were feeling. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, I think, was also about her teaching us that we had agency. And so that things don't just happen to you. And so think about. I think there's something pretty crazy about the fact that someone who is um, potentially going to become the first female president of the United States of America is going on a podcast called Call Her Daddy. <laughs> like, what a wild, what a wild political cycle. How you were feeling, not just as a way to dump, but also as a way to kind of figure out where you are in a moment, right? And center yourself. I mean, to your point, when I got older, like when I was in, I don't know, late teens, my- Absolutely wild and unexpected disclaimer in the morning shots today. Call her daddy. Amid yet another round of growing Democratic nervousness that her campaign is playing things too safe, Kamala Harris is stepping out this week for a significant round of interviews. Over the weekend, she taped a CBS interview that will be aired tonight on 60 Minutes. You can catch a preview of the clip of interview here. It will be on Late Show and The View. She will also do an interview with Howard Stern. Meanwhile, Tim Waltz, who appeared on Fox News yesterday, will make an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel tonight. The first stop on Harris's Media Blitz tour came yesterday when she did a women-focused interview with Alex Cooper, host of the uber-popular Call Her Daddy podcast. Editor note and disclaimer, Bill Crystal is a founding member of the Daddy Gang? Bill Crystal? Robert Skvarla says, Imagine you're a CIA officer in 1951. Your job involves creating a new magazine called Encounter. One of its editors will be Irving Crystal. Suddenly, you're struck by a premonition. In 70 years, you'll be indirectly responsible for something called Call Her Daddy. What do you do? Oh my God. Bill Crystal is a founding member of the daddy gang. What is going on? Why? What? Is, dude, America is such a weird. Dude, this is literally just like, uh, I guess it makes sense. I mean, Tucker Carlson. No wonder people become like conspiracy brained people, dude. Tucker Carlson's dad is literally a CIA member. Tucker Carlson's father is responsible for Voice of America, or was it Radio Free Europe or whatever? Bill Crystal is an American neoconservative writer. Crystal is now the editor at large of the center right publication, The Bulwark, and has been the host of Conversations with Bill Crystal. Crystal played a leading role in the defeat of the Clinton healthcare plan of 1993, as well as advocating for the 2003 invasion of Iraq. He has been associated with a number of conservative think tanks. He was a chairman of the New Citizenship Project. In 1997, he co-founded the Project for the New American Century, PNAC, with Robert Kagan. So, he's a member of the Board of Trustees for the Manhattan Institute Pro uh, Policy Research, which is an American conservative think tank, which houses the likes of, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Christopher Rufo, right? Christopher Rufo, Rufo is the Manhattan Institute guy, right? I think. Wait, let me, let me not get that wrong. I think so. I think he's Manhattan Institute. Yeah, that Manhattan Institute. You, you remember Christopher Rufo? The guy who was like leading the charge on the CRT and also woke DEI, that sort of stuff. Yeah, here he is, the goat. So Bill Crystal is one of the 
<laughs> one of the board of the trustees for the free market Manhattan Institute policy research. He's also uh, a director of the foreign policy initiative. He is one of the three board members of keep America safe. One day, 20 years from now, the Bulwark's white house correspondent is saying it was a joke. Oh, he is. Oh, f it is a joke. Why would you say that? Hi, Alec. This was, we thought obviously a joke, bro. You can't say that that's a joke. You put in a f editor's note. How is that? Why would you joke about a, f that's a, f insane th that's not a joke man a great joke too no that's not a great joke no this isn't a why did it lie moment you fucking idiot this is exactly how it's supposed to be done in normal news coverage what are you stupid this is not the onion this is a goddamn news publication it's like the new york times in a fucking article headline being like iran launched his nukes and then turning around and being like why does it lie if the new york times reports Iran launched its nukes, then you're going to assume Iran launched its nukes. There's a difference. You guys are insane. If you consider, if you consider a news organization writing a editor's note when normally they put in the editor's note as a conflict of interest oftentimes you know what i mean in the exact same format there is a major difference between clickbait headlines clickbait headlines and something being added onto the article oh my god anyway regardless one day i do think this about the never trump republicans one day 20 years down the line we are going to be reading news articles if america still exists about how the Republican neocons of the Bush administration expertly took advantage of the chaos that was happening in the aftermath of the first Trump presidency to completely overtake the Democratic Party and reshape it in their own vision. Mark my f words. We are going to be we're going to be doing how do we get here type uh, type news articles about how the Republican Party expertly infiltrated the Democratic Party and reshaped it in its own vision. Because we're there right now. I'm just saying it'll take 20 years for the news media to turn around and write these like, how do we get here articles? Based rant to cover for your mistake? No, I mean, th that part is still true regardless of the f Bill Crystal aspect of it. Is it expertly infiltrated if Biden and Kamala openly invited them in? To a certain degree, they took advantage of the lack of interest and uh, the, the the lack of interest in the Democratic Party's like top officials in make, maybe reading the room a little bit better and only reading the rooms full of donors. That's what the major problem here is. You will see. It's already happening currently. Anyway. 20s. If I came home with a problem, I'm telling you, every time I came, if I came home with a problem, the first thing my mother would do is she was look at me like other mothers, I believe, were hugging their kids and like, oh, honey, what can I do? And oh, the, my mother, the first thing, what did you do? But here's the thing that I realized. She was actually teaching me. I think the Cheney era Republicans have been sliding in the Democratic Party for a lot longer. No, I know. I know. This is the final culmination of that project. I'm not saying that it's happening overnight. It's been happening far before. It's been happening far before the Lincoln Project even started its initiative as like never Trump Republicans. They realize that they can just basically overtake the Democratic Party and reshape it in their own image. A party that presents stability, a party that represents stability with Republican policies. It's been going on for quite some time with like third way uh with uh, with with third way politics uh what what is the last version of that i mean it's just all neoliberalism through and through they welcomed it with open arms especially since the clinton era but now they're directly adopting actual former republicans they're directly adopting actual former republicans look no further than david from he said it in the Newsweek article that we just read. We've moved away from neoliberalism to like neoconservatism in the Democratic Party. Think about where you had agency in that moment and think about what you had the choice to do or not do. And like, don't let things just happen to you. And I realized that was a really powerful thing she was teaching, which is figure out how you can take charge of a moment. Yeah. You can't always, we don't have control of everything, obviously, but, but don't just let things happen to you without thinking about, okay, what can I do? Oh, by the way, I'm working on uh, getting ta Coats Coates on the broadcast and specifically talking to him about like, um, obviously his change of heart but more importantly than that um because that's been covered quite a bit in mainstream outlets 
I want to talk to him specifically about the way that the media used to celebrate him and how much that uh, how much that that relationship has almost changed overnight into a directly hostile relationship as a consequence of of him speaking truth to matters that he watched unfold in front of his eyes doing this moment it's fun to hear you say that because these are themes that i've talked about on my show before of like yeah we can sit here and dwell on something that happened to mm -hmm. us but then we can also say yeah but what could i have done in that situation to have autonomy over my life people can do things to you but you can only decide how you're going to react that's all you have that, control but that's over, right? exactly right but that's exactly yeah. right and in that way you you realize don't let anyone take your power from you yeah. you know that's so important i mean the other thing my mother would say all the time and i'm going to quote is don't do anything half assed yeah i'm curious when you're saying that about you know have agency over your own life yeah. and don't let things just happen to you like take control and take accountability how have you put that into being the vice president of the yeah. united states a lot of my career was as a prosecutor and so it was about really wanting to protect the most vulnerable and where they did not have the power. And it wasn't of their own choosing, but because they were the subject of abuse, because they were the subject of an imbalance of power, right? And so a lot of the work that I've done has been about wanting to restore to the extent I can play a role. Here's the cut seven One out of three version. women are by the At a rally in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. former president, so they they put like a seven minute video, and from what I've uh, from what I heard, like a lot of the f comments were very upset. It turns out that oh, the current ratio six hours ago was twelve k likes versus forty nine k dislikes. Apparent okay, yeah, Scotty, you just do something. Apparently, apparently, her f audience hates it. Her audience absolutely hates it. Yeah, I mean, it probably got brigaded. YouTube comments are notoriously conservative. Yeah, but I could totally see Call Her Daddy podcast like audience being somewhat right wing. It is a former Barstool publication after all. And her audience is predominantly white women. And white women, well, let's just say they're still holding on to that good old Republican Party. Okay. They're still desperately clinging on to clinging on to whatever crumb of power they feel they will have over minorities by remembering that they're white and i guess simultaneously forgetting that they are women you knew about this podcast before kamala went on call her daddy yeah it's it's a super f it's a massive podcast for years now this person i think has like a hundred million dollar contract from spotify for the record for those asking why harris went on call her daddy npr obtained a audience data on the show for medicine research 70 percent women 76 percent under 35 93 under 45 48% Democrat, 24% Republican, 20% Independent, 34% live in the South, 24% in the West, 22% in the Northeast, and 20% in the Midwest. Told you, vocal minority as always. I mean, no shot, it's 70% women. No, it makes sense. It makes sense. Also, I, I need you to understand why conservatives... Okay, calm down, guys. I need you to understand something that... Uh, that that is very significant here it's a 70 percent women audience and 76 percent of the audience is under 35 women under 35 are insanely democrat leaning so the fact that they're 48 percent democrat means that this is an unimaginably conservative female audience as in an unimaginably white female audience come on dude the f are you talking about that's why she went on there like d this data doesn't ring any alarm bells for you dude at all look at the look at the percentage of democrat party voters in the under 35 percent demographic for women i'm right her audience is very conservative much more conservative than the average under 35 female demographic you know right now this fight for what we need to do around reproductive freedom is i mean could it be more at its core about just the the, the basic right any individual of whatever gender has to make decisions about their own body and not have their government tell them what to do or even voting yeah right about saying look i know that there's cynicism i know that there that there are, there's a, a real feeling that well what does it matter does my vo voice matter but a lot of my push to kind of hopefully convince people that they should vote is because you should never let anybody take your power from you 
And voting is one of the ways that you use your voice to determine who your government will be and what your future will be by your government. You've already made history. You are the first female vice president. Yeah. You could very well become the next president of the United States. Yeah. What do you think your mom would say? Uh, well, okay, so here's, let me just tell you what my mother did say. Oh, I was looking at the wrong thing. I wanted to watch president this. President Trump recently told women, you will be protected and I will be your protector. What do you make of that? So he who, when he was president, hand selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade. And they did just as he intended. And there are now 20 states with Trump abortion bans. Yeah, she got a 60 mil Spotify deal. In late spring of 2020, Cooper and Franklin were engaged in a publicized dispute with Barstool founder David Portner, which resulted in Franklin leaving the show. Cooper reached an agreement with Barstool and continued hosting the podcast on her own. Including bans that make no exception for rape or incest, which we just discussed, which means that you're telling a survivor of a crime of a violation to their body they don't have a right to make a decision about what happens to their body next, which is immoral. So this is the same guy that is now saying that? This is the same guy who said that women should be punished for having abortions. This is the same guy who uses the kind of language he does to describe women. So yeah, there you go. I do want to focus <laughs> on abortion for a moment because two years ago, Roe v. Wade was overturned and women mm -hmm. lost their constitutional right to an abortion. I put out an episode about it. I flew to North Carolina. Yeah. I went to a preferred women's health center. I met with women that mm -hmm. were getting screamed at and chanted at and called baby killers and it was who says women under 30 demographic are 65 percent democrat 30 percent republican so yeah this audience is very conservative for the demo thank you that's what i was saying the most eye-opening experience i've yeah. ever had because i am a privileged white woman that lives in los angeles and i am so i just love that conservative women just don't care about bodily autonomy what a great country we have i mean what are you supposed to do you know you want kaya to come in aware of that um I understand that a lot of the younger generation sees things online mm -hmm. and it's like, what is right? What is wrong? What is real? What is not? Can you explain and talk about what is actually happening to abortion access right now in this country? Yeah. So again, I thank you for what you've been doing at the earliest stage of this and following the stories. So, you know, on public policy, I often tell my team, look, I don't want to hear about public policy is a fancy kind of speech or, or, or paper, tell me how it'll affect a real person. So let's talk about how it affects a real person. The majority of women who receive abortion care are mothers. So if she's in a state, and by the way, every state in the South, except for Virginia, has an abortion ban, okay? Um, so imagine she's in a state with an abortion ban. One out of three women are, by the way, in our country. And she's a mom. So she's going to have to figure out, one, God help her if she has affordable child care. God help her if she has paid leave. And then she's going to have to go to the airport, stand in a TSA line. Please tell me this white woman redeems herself by asking about Palestine, please. You're, I, do, I doubt it. I don't think that this is, no. Sit on a plane next to a perfect stranger to go to a city where she's never been to receive the care she needs She's going to probably have to get right back on that plane because she's got those kids. Her best friend's probably not with her because that's who's taking care of the kids. To get back in that TSA line, to get back on a plane, to go home. This No, this is not a CIA-affiliated podcast, man. Shut up. No. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. That person was just joking on the bulwark, which is crazy. Holy shit. Now I'm spreading misinformation. Jesus Christ. No matter how much I... I, no matter how much I corrected it, I'm joking. Oh, okay. Well, thank God you're joking. But others, please understand, it, it, this is not, Bill Crystal is not involved in all her daddy. And that's all if they can even afford exactly. the plane ticket or the bus ticket. Exactly. Exactly. Because when Roe v. Wade was overturned, I remember my DMs were flooded with yeah. thousands of women begging me to help and yeah. it's overwhelming and mm -hmm. i can't even imagine i'm saying that in front of you but it's it's overwhelming and i remember people begging me like i just need to afford a bus ticket so i can yeah. get out of this abortion desert yeah. that i live in in the south so i can get to a state but 
they can't even afford, you know what I mean? So it's like it's these people awful. are literally landlocked into a position that they don't want to be. And and here's the thing. Here's the thing is that you don't have to abandon your faith or deeply held beliefs to agree. The government shouldn't be telling her what to do. If she chooses, she'll talk to her priest, her pastor, her rabbi, her imam, but not the government telling you what to do. And that's what's so outrageous about it is a bunch of these guys up in these state capitals are writing these decisions because they somehow have decided that they're in a better position to tell you what's in your best interest than you are to know what's in your own best interest. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. I mean, daddy gang, to put it in um, our TikTok terms, um, I have seen girls on the street walk up to men and be like, do you know where a tampon goes? Do you know how many tampons we use? Do you even know how, like, do you know what a X or Y or Z is of a part of our, and they don't know the answer. I was the first vice president or president to ever in office uh, go to a reproductive health care clinic ever really yes 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 i didn't know that but i guess that makes sense that's just crazy by the way that is actually f nuts god damn the democratic party is so f unimaginably conservative what the f dude i remember a time when unironically people were just like yeah we can't be funding like you know we we still, we, we can't fund abortion clinics, dude, with federal funds. Like, this country is so goddamn captive to the most insane right-wing sociopaths, dude. Holy f shit. One of the best issues on the ballot and one of the best audience to discuss it with, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is not a bad podcast appearance, especially if they're talking about abortion, reproductive rights, how uh, she will defend it all that shit it's not bad if you want to win the election because the reality is every every move in this direction counts for the election this is the exact opposite of going to f wyoming and doing a f country is over party uh with with liz cheney and you celebrate dick cheney endorsing you there like this is the exact opposite of that this is at least in the smart direction in terms of campaigning sense mm -hmm. to your point and yet the men are making the decisions and, about and our here's bodies. and here's the other thing about this point it, that it, it's about ivf treatments and access it's about access to contraception which is very much at risk with these folks um remember the stem cell research bans of course i remember that's back when like online atheists used to f hate the bush administration because they were anti-science and then they literally adopted the bush administration's most aggressive stance against islam and decided Obama was too pro-Muslim and maybe a Muslim himself. Every single person online that used to f despite, with the exception of Kyle Kalinske, every single online atheist. And I know all this because, you know, I at least at that point was like obviously familiar with the Young Turks, you know. Kyle Kalinske was one of the only f atheists online, like annoying atheists online who didn't fall into that trap. Every single one. I mean, he was always anti id Paul and that's fine. That's whatever. But he was never like doing it in a mean spirited way. Thank you for giving Kyle the respect that he deserves. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to do that with his haircut, but, but yeah, secular, secular talk, right? <laughs> his hair is cool, fam. I mean, I've always, I've, I've liked Kyle for years. Come on. I love Kyle. Listen, Kyle Kalinske was one of the very few outspoken online atheists that didn't make that transition from the Bush administration to the uh, to the Obama administration and like totally fucking decided like Islam is the greatest enemy of the Western world and the Western world is superior and we must defend it unconditionally. It is about back to the point about reproductive health clinics. You know what those clinics also do? They do PAPs. They do Kyle Fieri gonna take you to secular town? Stop. Breast cancer screenings. They do HIV testing. And they're having to close in many places with these bans. So think about the fact that for anyone who has gone to one of these clinics, you understand that it is sometimes the most trusted place where people receive that kind of health care because they walk into those places that are generally staffed by people who who create a safe place for people to come in without judgment. So anyone seeking any kind of reproductive health care and, and wanting to go to a place where they feel safe and without judgment, these clinics have often been the place that people can go. 
And many of them are having to close because of these laws. I was raised Catholic mm -hmm. and abortion is a sin. Mm -hmm. And when I put out that episode, I had a lot of women reach out to me saying like, wow, I, I you know, live in the South and I never thought about it that way. Like maybe I am pro-choice because I won't get an abortion because yeah. of my religion, right. but why should we control what <coughs> someone else wants and that's to do? Exa and you know what's interesting, Alex, to your point, what I'm finding as I travel, people who before two years ago, before Roe v. Wade was, was overturned, people who felt very strong about that they are anti-abortion, anti-abortion, are now seeing what's happening and saying, hmm, I didn't intend for all this to happen. And I think that's also why in state after state, so-called red states and so-called blue states, when this issue has been on the ballot, the American people are voting for freedom. Because ultimately it's about, look, this is not about imposing my thoughts on you in terms of what you do with your life or your body. It's, it's actually quite the opposite. It's saying the government shouldn't be telling people what to do. Hi, Daddy Gang. Thank you so much. Hi, Daddy Gang. I'm here with the vice president, and she's being so slay. Oh, here. There's no reward for being stupid. And then finally, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, finally, the last couple of days, the vice president goes on some show called Call call her daddy or call your daddy or or who's call your daddy, daddy or something call me daddy <laughs> i like who's your daddy better um and and i like who's your daddy better <laughs> next time oh you don't like the police next time you get into an altercation call a crackhead oh choice dude i hate this freak i hate him so much and among other things, she's talking about uh, about about tampons. There's no reward for being stupid. And then finally, you and then finally, and then finally, call her daddy. Isn't the same asshole told the Arabic woman to stick her head in a bag? Yes. By the way, before you say uh, there's no reward for being stupid, well, he's stupid. Dog, he's literally a Rhodes Scholar. If there is a perfect demonstration of LARP, it is him. No, he is not stupid. He, much like many of the uh, politicians, especially on the Republican side, are incredibly well-educated, oftentimes from f Harvard and Yale. He just happens to be from Louisiana. He went to Oxford, dude. Thank you. He's not stupid. He's just a ginormous piece of sh He is also very racist.